Hello, this is uh, Joseph Holbrook. I'm continuing my series on religion in Latin America. And uh, today is part two from chapter one on foundations from Gonzalez and Gonzalez Christianity in Latin America. And today we're going to talk about Iberia and Africa. I have way too many slides and not enough time, so I'm going to go rather fast if you'll bear with me. Uh, at the end, I will post perhaps a link where you can go to the Prezi if you want to review it a little more uh, calmly. So we're going to begin with Spain today. Some of the uh, foundations or the background of Spanish Catholicism. And so uh, in the 1470s, Isabel and Ferdinand, two different kings of diff various principalities of Spain married. And by their marriage, they united all, most of the principal uh, areas of Spain into a modern unitary nation state. They wanted their cultural and religious situation to reflect their national political situation. They wanted one throne, one kingdom, one language, and one religion. Uh, the uh, Actually, the uh, medieval tradition was that there had been a high level of tolerance and religious pluralism in southern Spain under the Muslim rulers of Al-Andalus. They had allowed uh, Christian, Jewish, and uh, Muslim scholars to work together translating texts from Greek to Arabic into Latin. Uh, that was called, uh, there was a golden age, and there was convivencia in Spanish it was called. However, by this time, there's a growing sentiment in Spain that Spain needs to be unified. Uh, speaking of Jews, there was, uh, Jews had lived in Spain from the very early date of the third century under the Visigoths, and they were well integrated into Iberian society. The Muslim invasion of Spain began in 711. Within a decade, the Moors, as the Spanish Muslims were called, controlled the entire peninsula. The first great caliphate of Spain was in Cordoba. And today you can still go there and see the magnificent uh, mosque in Cordoba. And here's a view from the outside. So we had religious tolerance, or one might say intolerance, depending on what period of time we're talking about. I mentioned the convivencia already. Uh, as there as this drive to Christianize all of Spain continued over an 800-year period, Spanish Catholics began to reimagine their history and rewrite their history, creating a, a myth of the Reconquista, as the author of the book, Justo Gonzalez, puts it. Uh, this is a, a romantic, this is not, it's not to say that it's not historically true at all, it's to say that it was romanticized. Uh, there were periods of time when Christian kings fought against other Christian kings and, and made allies of the Muslims, Muslims and Christians fighting together against other Christians or vice versa. And so, uh, but this is not the, the myth. The myth is that the Christians heroically fought for 800 years, driving the Muslims out and retaking their territory. So military might became part of the warp and woof of medieval Catholicism. Catholicism became a very militant in a in the military sense of the word, and you might say violent. There were times when uh, Catholic priests fought alongside uh, Span Spanish troops, and there was a saying that is still used today in Latin America, con, uh, con el mazo dando y a Dios rogando, which means that uh, I'm praying to God while I'm bashing their heads out with the mace. To, that's a loose translation. And so uh, this is the idea that uh, Christians can be milit militantly violent in the service of, the, of God and in faith. And of course, this is going to have implications in the arrival in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the Catholic monarchs didn't only want to have religious purity. Among Catholics, they also sought a society that was homogeneous. They wanted a uniform, homogeneous 
Christian society without Jews, without Muslims, speaking one language under one throne in one religion. So by 1492, all practicing Jews in Spain were ordered to convert to Christianity or face expulsion within four months. The Shepardim, uh, which uh, are the uh, Jews of Spanish or Iberian origin, sometimes Middle Eastern, uh, as opposed to the Ashkenazim, which are Eastern European Jews. The Shepardim left Spain uh, as exiles, going, prim going to North Africa, going to the Middle East, but a large number of them went to Portugal, and another group went to Holland. Holland was Dutch Calvinist. Portugal, of course, was Catholic, but both were more tolerant than Spain at that point in time. There was anywhere from 100 to 200,000 that left. By 1499, the Moors were in the same boat, and they were ordered to convert to Roman Catholicism or leave the country. Uh, many Moors stayed but did not convert. Finally, uh, there was an uprising, Islamic up uprising in 1609, and all Muslims were forced to leave the country. It's estimated that 90% of these Moriscos, uh, the Moriscos are those who converted to Catholicism but were suspected of still secretly being Muslim just as new, new Christians or conversos uh, describe the same phenomena among Jews. The Spanish Inquisition was, uh, was an invention. The Inquisition already existed. It was called the Holy Office of the Inquisition uh, uh, in the Roman Catholicism. But the Spanish monarchs asked permission of the Pope to have a particular specific Spanish Inquisition under the control of the state of the monarchs and it penetrated every sector of Spanish society. They were concerned about the corrupting influence of the Jewish conversos or new Christians. In other words, Jews that obeyed and converted to Christianity were now highly suspect of being a corrupting influence or suspect of being hidden Jews continuing to practice their Judaism under the radar. And there were some of those uh, hidden Jews. To ensure orthodoxy, the crowns petitioned Rome in 1478 to establish the Holy Office in Castile. The double purpose of the Inquisition was to enforce purity of religious practice and also political unity. And it was eventually replicated in the Americas. And it also inevitably became a tool of personal vengeance and political intrigue and also a method of gaining wealth. Uh, most scholars agree that Portuguese Catholicism was substantially different than Spanish Catholicism. Uh, Portuguese Catholics or the Catholic Church in Portugal uh, was, was considered to be relatively looser and more tolerant, uh, more easygoing than the Spanish, less militant. Several reasons for this might include that the Portugal won its uh, victories over the Moors and drove them out of Portugal in 1139, whereas the Spanish didn't achieve that until 1492, the same year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, so the Portuguese had two and a half, three centuries to chill out, to relax, and to uh, let go of some of their uh, religious militancy, if they ever had it to the same degree in the first place. In uh, 1418, Prince Henry the Navigator created a school for uh, navigation, for boating, and they began to develop newer technology that allowed Portuguese vessels to leave sight of the shore and sail out on the open ocean. And they began a trek down the western coast of Africa, seeking a route around Africa to arrive in the Indies, or the India, the Spice Islands of Indonesia. This is partly because the uh, the um, the Turks, I'm forgetting the name, the Ottoman Empire had taken control of the Silk Road over from the Mongols. The Mongols had been very tolerant and laissez-faire. Anyone could travel the Silk Road as long as they paid the tax. Didn't matter your religion. The Ottoman Turks, on the other hand, were very zealous for their uh, their religious preference and closed off the trade of the Silk Road to Christians. So the uh, Portuguese wanted to find another route to India, and so did Spain. 
although Spain was occupied with trying to reconquer their territory. Uh, Spanish Catholicism was also influenced by the Council of Trent around 1540, which was ca often called the Counter-Reformation. It was a reaction against the Protestant Reformation initiated with Luther and with Germans, German Lutherans. The, uh, the reforms of the Counter-Reformation hardened Spanish Catholicism, put it on a more rational and uh, uh, rational basis rather than mystery or uh, mysticism. Portuguese Catholicism didn't was not influenced by the Counter-Reformation until much later. Uh, and so the Portuguese Catholicism continued to be more medieval or more mis, uh, mis, mystic, you might say. It was more of a popular religion than the Catholic version was. Within uh, one to 200,000 Spanish Jews were expelled from Spain, and many of them went to Holland, which was uh, Dutch Calvinist and practiced a uh, form of freedom of conscience or freedom of religion, uh, or Portugal, which was relatively more tolerant. Both the Dutch Calvinists and the Portuguese were more tolerant, as I said. So many Sephardic Jews ended up in Brazil that for a time the words Jew and Portuguese became interchangeable among Spanish Creoles. Uh, in Spain, Isabella and Ferdinand turned their attention to uh, Portuguese Portugal's head start in the race for India, and so Isabella agreed to sponsor Christopher Columbus and a voyage west under the theory that by going directly west instead of going around Africa, they might be able to get to India first uh, before Portugal. He arrived in the Bahamas two months later where he encountered uh, Arawak or Taino Indians who were a sedentary, peaceful people who would give Columbus eventually enough gold to make his gamble pay off. He eventually relocated in uh, is the island of Hispaniola and, and created a settlement there, which is today's Dominican Republic in Haiti. Pope Alexander VI issued a Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 in order to keep peace between Spain and Portugal. Uh, this was a line 370 leagues west of Cape Verde Islands, a, a north-south line that divided the world in half. And uh, so the west west of this uh, line of Tordesillas was, uh, was to be Spain's area of influence, and east of that was supposed to be Portugal's. It just so happened that the line cut through the western portion of Brazil, and so the the western coast of Brazil came under Portuguese influence, according to Pope Alexander VI, who thought he had the authority to divide the world in half and give it to whoever he wanted. The French and the English, the Dutch, were not particularly happy about that. This is an artist's rendering of the arrival of Columbus in the Bahamas. Here's another artist's rendering from 1728 of uh, Christopher Columbus arriving in bartering with the uh, Tainos. In 1501, the Spanish crown was given the right to collect tithes levied in the Americas in order to pay for its missionary activities. In exchange for a lot of the uh, rights and privileges that the Pope gave to the Spanish crown, in turn, Spain was supposed to be responsible for the spiritual care of the uh, Amerindians and for the teaching them about the gospel. And by 1508, Pope Julius II granted the Spanish monarch the Patronato Real, or the, the royal patronage. It was the right to make nominations for all American ecclesiastical posts. Complete royal control of the ecclesiastical structure of the Indies. This represented a complete unification of the crown and the cross, the church and the state. So now that it was the monarchy, the state, that was appointing all the priests, actually nominating priests and bishops, not only in Spain, but in all of the Spanish territories in the Americas. And the Pope would uh, put its, his rubber stamp on it, or the Vatican. However, th that meant that bishops and priests were uh, royal servants or uh, ministers of the state as well as of the church. 
This led to heated debates in Europe about just war and about the treatment of the Native Americans. Christopher Columbus made his second voyage to uh, to uh, Hispaniola and to Cuba. Uh, he brought with him three Franciscans, a Hieronymite and an ex-Benedictine. The story of Atui is a story that's told by Bartolome de las Casas, who I'll mention later. But uh, Hatui was a Indian chief in Haiti, what is now the modern nation of Haiti, Hispaniola, where he was in conflict with the Spaniards. And rather than uh, be persecuted by them and enslaved, he fled with his people to Cuba. Eventually, the Spaniards followed into Cuba. Uh, and Bartolome de las Casas was one of the encomenderos or conquistadores that accompanied them. And when they finally caught up with Hatui and were ready to burn him at the stake, the priest, Franciscan priest, spoke with him earnestly and uh, begged him to become a Christian and take communion so that he could go to heaven. Hatui asked if there were Spaniards in heaven. So goes the story by Las Casas. And when he was told that uh, there were at least some good Spaniards in heaven, Hatui said, then I'd rather go to hell because I don't want to be around those Spaniards. Uh, and so he died by burning instead of uh, a more merciful death. The encomienda was an arrangement where uh, a Spanish conquistador, which was basically the same as a mercenary, they were not Spanish soldiers, but they were privateers who worked uh, uh, kind of on an entrepreneurial mercenary basis, if they, uh, in exchange for their services, they were granted an encomienda or a charge where they would have uh, 200 Indians working for them on a particular plantation and uh, they would benefit or, pro or, or profit from the labor of these Indians. In exchange, they were charged to bring instruction and Christian instruction and Christian care to the Indians, which rarely happened. So most encomenderos worked their Indians to death, leading to a severe labor shortage in a short period of time that necessitated uh, slave trip, slaving trips to Florida, Nicaragua, and other places. By 1509, there were only around 62,000 uh, Indians left in Hispaniola, which was a decline of 95%. Bartolome de las Casas had estimated two or three million original inhabitants. Some people consider that to be inflated, but still, whatever the original number was, 62,000 was an extreme uh, extinction event. And by 1540, there was only a few hundreds left on the island. Who was it that went to Florida looking for the uh, Fountain of Youth? Um, I can't remember the name right now, but uh, actually, the actual history is he was looking for slaves in Florida. The other face, we've talked before about the two faces of the two faces of the church in the Americas, and we've already seen the uh, cruel face of exploitation and c conquest and violence. The other face, though, is very real, and there's a couple of examples here of some Spaniards who were priests who were defenders of human rights and defenders of the Indians. Uh, one, Antonio de Montesinos, was a Dominican priest on Hispaniola who uh, gave a thundering sermon on Sunday before Christmas, 1511, basically threatening his uh, Spanish congregants with hell and damnation for their mistreatment of the Native Americans. Bartolome de las Casas was in that uh, in that meeting or that mass, heard the message, and uh, shortly after that went to Cuba where he saw atrocities that led him to uh, convert and become a Dominican priest himself. Here's the text of Antonio Montesinos, but before the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. Um, attempts at reform. Montesinos and Dominicans sufficiently influenced the crown to get some reforms, such as the law of Burgos in 1512, However, most of the Spanish ignored it using an age-old tradition that goes, Obedezco pero no cumplo. I obey, but I do not comply. Bartolomé de las Casas uh, 
became uh, was transformed by the horror of the atrocities that he saw. You can download his book, uh, a, a short account of the conquest of the Indies, uh, from Kindle. I think it's free. You can download it for free. Fifteen fifteen, he was ordained a Dominican priest and became known as the defender of the Indians. And he spent the next uh, what about fifty years fighting on behalf of the Indians, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully. He is considered to be the author of the of the Black Legend that the that the English and the French Protestants and and Dutch used to accuse the Spaniards of of uh, human rights violations and exceptional cruelty in the New World. It played into the Protestant Reformation, although I doubt that that was his intention. Bartolomé de las Casas, a remarkable man. So now that the uh, Cuba had been uh, occupied by the Spanish, Hernán Cortés launched with 11 ships and traveled up from the Yucatán up uh, actually, from Guatemala up to past the Yucatan and and landed his ships at Veracruz. He had heard of a large, uh, large uh, empire. I don't know if he knew of it as empire, but a large civilization in the highlands of Mexico. And with uh, 500 men and 16 horses, he landed in 1519 and began a journey up through, winding up through the mountains to Tenochtitlan, which was the capital city of the Aztec Empire. He disassembled his ships, all but one that he used for a message ship, following the example of Julius Caesar, who burned his ships when he landed his troops in, in Britain. Uh, but uh, Hernan Cortes wisely didn't burn his uh, ships. He disassembled them and later he was able to reassemble them as smaller boats, war boats, to use in the Lake Texcoco. Here's an example of one of those war boats. And uh, this is the battle for Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan was a city built on the lake with causeways connecting it to the mainland, which was genius for defense. However, Hernan Cortez was a good tactician, and he was able to... Uh, after several months of fighting, he was able to take the city and cut off the head of the Aztec Empire, which made it relatively easy to dominate uh, the the Aztecs and the other tribes that they dominated. This is a, a Aztec rendering of the battle showing uh, warriors defending the temple. The Mayans of Yucatan and Guatemala were a different story. Uh, the Mayans, the Mayan civilization was not an empire. There were a number of city-states. It was decentralized. It was more like the Greek mainland with all the Greek city-states uh, before Alexander. And uh, not a unitary empire with a unitary capital that commanded. And so uh, in order to uh, reduce the Mayans to submer su submission, the Spanish had to take their cities one by one and their their jungle villages, etc. They were more difficult to conquer. Uh, they had heard that the Spanish were coming from their contacts with the Caribbean Arawak Indians. And they were already preparing to fight before the Spanish arrived. Um, the military conquest began in 1527. It took more than 10 years and even... Then the Mayas continued a hit-and-run strategy until 1545. The final conquest was not until 1697. I would say the, the conflict has actually continued up and through the 20th century because there was, war, there was a civil war in Guatemala that lasted 40 years during the uh, end of the Cold War, and some people feel that it ended in a Mayan genocide in the late 1980s and early 1990s under the dictator general Efrain Rios Montt. 200,000 of these uh, Mayan Indian peasants died fighting against Guatemalan central authority. Uh, the, the Franciscan missionaries arrived to begin a religious conquest among the Mayans in 1544. 
a uh, particular leader, uh, leader or priest, Franciscan Diego de Landa, is infamous for burning, uh, burning Mayan books, burning their history, destroying their records after they discovered hidden Indian idols in a cave. He uh, tortured more than 4,500 Indians and at least 150. This shows the book burning. A lot of Mayan history was destroyed. This is the La Garrucha, where a person's hands are tied behind their back and they're raised off the ground. Uh, 150 Indians died from this torture. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Diego de Landa was the Spanish colonists complained about his brutality. He was sent back to Spain for several years. When he finally returned to the Yucatan, he was a changed man and he became a defender uh, on behalf of the Mayan Indians. So people do change sometimes, I guess. This is a quote from the book of Chilambalam, uh, which is a Mayan book. The descendants of the former rulers are brought to misery. We are Christianized while they treat us like animals. Syncretism is the combination of two different religions into a religion that's actually not one or the other, but a combination of both. And of course, when Christianity was imposed with such a, a heavy hand of coercion, it did not succeed in killing off the old gods and replacing the old religion with an entirely new pristine Catholicism or Christianity but rather there was a mixing and matching and a combination called syncretism. Indian communities claimed their own brand of Christianity with a unique mixture of indigenous ways and Spanish ways. Des despite nor enormous efforts by the Spaniards to create this religious homogeneity as they attempted to do in their homeland, or at least hegemony, which means to have dominant uh, dominance. There was in the new world a birth of a new religious reality as well as new racial and cultural realities. Many, uh, many chapels devoted to saints and to the Virgin were built over, um, built over sites that were had been used to worship the uh, Mayan gods and goddesses. Uh, one example in Mexico City, of course, was the example of the Virgin of Guadalupe built over the shrine of the the uh, goddess Tonitzin. The conquest of the Inca Empire was similar to the conquest, conquest of the uh, Aztecs. Uh, the, the Spaniards were led by Francisco Pizarro, an illegitimate son of a minor Spanish noble. He, he had been, he had an encomienda in Panama, but he wanted to make greater wealth and a greater name for himself. He began his climb up the Andes in 1532 with 168 men and uh, he was lucky his timing was perfect the Sapa Inca and his heir had heir designated heir had died from a smallpox epidemic and the two remaining sons Atahuapa and Huascar were in the middle of a civil war and uh, so Pizarro managed to through lies and cheating and surprise Pizarro managed a, a surprise attack on Atahualpa, who had a much larger army, but he was captured and they uh, negotiated with Atahualpa to get him to bring a ransom of an entire room full of gold. And after that, Pizarro had him strangled. And uh, it's the book, the author points out that even though the Spaniards were uh, committed acts, acts of atrocity, they, they were violent, they were brutal. They still viewed their victories, sometimes amazing, almost miraculous victories, as a sign of God's favor. And uh, they sincerely saw themselves as Christians. Uh, although this is a very different medieval, a militant and medieval uh, vision of what a Christian might be. So now we go to Africans, who also brought a major component of the foundations of Latin American religion. Uh, the Africans who came to the New World did not come willingly or as free people. They were taken through violence and coercion in overwhelming numbers, cut off from their lands and loosened from the moorings of their traditions. They did bring with them their traditions and cultures and religion. Uh, this is an example of the Middle Passage. The boats, uh, the, sh the slaves were laid out and uh, 
small areas that were they couldn't stand up they couldn't move around uh, as they were transported across I've heard as many as 20 million were brought to the New World but uh, the vast majority didn't or at least some large number didn't survive they died on the passage um, most of these slaves came from West Africa because it was the closest to the Americas. In fact, West Africa is not really far from uh, Eastern Brazil, if you look at the map. Uh, also, this is where Portugal had established its trading posts. The most famous of these areas is found in Benin and in the southwestern corner of Nigeria. It's called the Yoruban religion or the Yoruban people. The Yoruba cosmology held that there was only one world with a visible part and that which the humans occupied and there was, there was an invisible part occupied by the Orishas and the ancestors. The Orishas could be seen in the trees and the rocks present, present in the lightning and the ocean. The Orisha could be seen anywhere. The practice of traditional African religions by slaves was a way to maintain cultural identity, define power within the slave population, to provide a basis of resistance far beyond the reach of the slave master. So uh, Yoruban religion co combined with Catholicism in Cuba to create what we call today Santeria or the Regla de Ochoa, which is very prominent here in Miami as well as in Cuba. And the Yoruban religion combined with Catholicism in Brazil to create Candomblé. Uh, in, in Haiti, you have voodoo, which is not from Yoruban roots, but from another religious tradition in Africa and Catholicism. So in conclusion, the Spanish and those they conquered were forever changed by the encounter. Uh, everything and everyone was changed in this process. The conquistadores were changed. The indigenous people, the European missionaries were challenged and changed. We had the Colombian exchange, which was the exchange of food, plants, animals, and diseases with the old world, food and plants and animals and diseases coming across to the new world and vice versa coming back. The religious authority of the Catholic Church was challenged and questioned. For example, the doctrine of the Trinity had determined because of the doctrine of the Trinity, the medieval uh, Europeans had conceptualized three continents with three racial human racial groupings. Also, this went along with the story of Noah and his three sons. However, now you have a fourth continent and a fourth racial group. So how do you have to, does that force you to rethink the Trinity or, or rethink your theology? Uh, political changes also came about. Economic changes were huge. The gold and silver that were mined and shipped to Charles V and later Philip II were spent uh, they spent great wealth trying to recover the lands lost to the Protestant Reformation. They also, rather than developing a, a manufacturing base in Spain, they sent a good deal of that wealth to England and Holland to buy manufactured products, leaving Spain behind in the early Industrial Revolution. So that's Foundations, Iberia, and Africa. And we shall continue on next week with the arrival of Christianity.